Please join me now in our scripture lesson taken from Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. Let us begin. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the good will of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. At this time, I'd like to invite the children forward for the children's time. Okay. So, we were just reading in scripture about the early followers of, of Jesus. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship. Fellowship is means when we get together. When we get together and to breaking of bread, eating, and prayers. Um, have you ever had a big family meal? Yes. Thanksgiving. Any other times? Yes. Birthdays. Jack, um, Owen? Eating with a what? A sheep? That's so funny. Today is Good Shepherd Sunday. How did you know that? Um, Isa. Yesterday was your birthday. Happy birthday. Anybody else had a birthday this, this week? This, happy birthday. Thank you for letting us know. What did you, what did you have for dessert? S'mores for the party, and for your actual birthday, you had ice cream. What flavor ice cream? Vanilla. Very good. I had chocolate. And you had chocolate. Okay. That's awesome. Um, and which makes me, which makes me think, my, we always, um, do they have Carvel around here? Okay. From when I was a kid, we always got Carvel ice cream cakes for birthdays, right? But I don't like the chocolate ice cream, so my mom would always eat the chocolate for me, and she'd give me her vanilla. Guess what I found out as an adult? She doesn't like chocolate ice cream. Isn't that sweet? Isn't that sweet? Chocolate's amazing. Okay, let's debate that. Chocolate ice cream is, no, okay. Yeah, I still don't like chocolate ice cream. All right, but that's not what the, okay. I'm, this is me. I went down. I went down that path. My fault. All right, so they got together. Have you ever, when we get together, like big family gatherings, right, is it always joyful? No. Are there, are there times where people might get on each other's nerves? Yes, all the time, right? So, so uh, at my house growing up, this is when my, my grandma was still alive. She had, two, she had two brothers, and they would bicker. Uh, and it was, and it was always a, a tense time, you know, sibling rivalry. You ever heard of that? Yeah. No. So that's when, like, you kind of you get when brothers and sisters or your siblings, we get you get on each other's nerves, and right. And guess what? It can last into your 80s. Yeah. And so, and so, sometimes when we get together, it can be joyful, and then sometimes it can also be. Uh, not so fun because folks are folks and people are people and we bring all of our humanity to us to the table. So it talks about the early church in this passage that we just read and it sounds wonderful. But guess what? Folks are folks and people are people and everybody brought their humanity. And when we get together... Um, and we stay together and decide to be together, we have to learn sometimes how to forgive. And we have to, well, we always have to learn how to forgive. And yes, 
people are actually animals. That is true. Yeah, sometimes people do eat like, mm, yeah, okay, we, we could go down that path too. Um, all right, let me, so, so I want, <laughs> I love being with you all. This is so much fun, and we could go down that, but we're, I want to, there's more to the service, so we have to go, keep going, pushing forward. Um, I just want to say, in this passage, it said, they had the goodwill of all the people, it says, and more and more people were gathering, to that, gathering together with them which is wonderful, but I want to point out it was, it was never easy because folks are folks and people are people and we can get on each other's nerves um, whether we're related or whether we're not related and they had to learn how to work all that stuff out. But I also like the idea that being church together, being a follower of Jesus Christ, means coming together and praying for one another and eating food together and sharing uh, not only of our stories and our lives, but also how we can help one another. Well, that sounds pretty nice, right? Yeah. That's what we're doing now. Say that again. What? Nothing? Okay. All right. Yes, Owen. Can, and at the All right. Two. On the count of three, I want all of you to tell me what, think about it for a second. What is your favorite ice cream? What is your favorite ice cream flavor? And we're all going to say it. Everybody, on the count of three. One, two, three. Black <laughs> raspberry. I love this. Okay. We should, have a, we should have an ice cream party one of these days. Okay, let's hold our hands, close our eyes, bow our heads, and dear God, thank you for, thank you for ice cream. And thank you for lactate for the people who can't have the ice cream. Uh, but thank you for uh, coming together, for friendship, for laughter. Uh, and also for the ways that, uh, and for teaching us about forgiveness and love and being in relationship is not easy, but it's worth it. And so we are grateful for this family of faith and for these kids uh, this day. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And we're all going to say a prayer for our Sunday school teachers because they have their hands full today. Woohoo! Our next scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. Very truly, and Jesus is talking. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all, his, out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus, again, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. And then in the next verse, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So on Facebook, they suggest pages 
people or groups that they think you might like based on what you have already liked. And recently, the pa a page that found me is the Gate Appreciation Society. People take pictures of gates and post them. And like anything, you can uh, have a picture of a basic gate or uh, it can be a piece of art or an engineering marvel. So I just took the top five when I was preparing this and just so that you could see, okay, there's the first one, the next slide. And then the next slide, right? And on and on, right? I love this, that somebody has created a gate appreciation society and that there are nearly 120,000 people around the world who are, who are appreciating um, gates. But when I, because I had been reading this passage for, for this morning, I at first thought maybe it was like some clever Christian where it was going to be a, a Christian, like, uh, you know, Jesus society, because it was the gate appreciation society, because Jesus in this passage says, I am the gate. But no, it's just interest in gates. We are much more likely to call Jesus the good shepherd than we are to call him the gate. And it's a confusing passage. I actually drew a diagram in my notebook while I was, while I was uh, reading this. There's a gate to the sheepfold. Now, a sheepfold, would be, it would be a common practice that shepherds would bring their sheep into a sheepfold. It would be like a stone enclosure, a stone wall, and then there would be a gate to let them in. And different shepherds and different flocks would use the same sheepfold. And so that's why it's important that the sheep knew the shepherd's voice and because the shepherd would call and that shepherd's sheep would follow the, the shepherd out. So that's why Jesus says it's important that they know my voice. So in this passage, Jesus says, I am the gate. The gatekeeper opens the gate for the shepherd, also Jesus, to call to them the sheep and then lead the sheep out. The, le the sheep are led outside for nourishment during the day and protection led back in for protection at night. So in this passage, Jesus is both the gate and the shepherd. And then there's a gatekeeper that goes unnamed, which made me think of, uh, but, the, but Jesus being the gate and the shepherd made me think of this wonderful children's sermon uh, moment I heard, and it wasn't me leading it. It was the youth director at the last church, and we had this very smart little girl, and she stopped him and she said, wait a second, Jesus is the son of God and also God. And the youth director just smiled and goes, yes. And I can't make it any more simple than that. And all the adults were going, yeah. <laughs> and God bless him. So Jesus is the gate and the shepherd, the one who takes the tickets at the door and then leads the tour. Yes. Made me, this passage also made me think whether we couldn't play with a little Trinitarian theology that the gate could be the Holy Spirit that opens to people. Maybe. Or we could accuse Jesus of mixing his metaphors. And I imagine, you know, one of the disciples saying, hey, hey, you're mixing your metaphors, you know, and Jesus giving a little side eye and say, yes, yes, you're very smart, put your hand down. But let's focus in on the context of this passage. John 9 is the healing of the blind man. He's still talking to the blind man here. Um, Jesus goes and finds him because he's found, he has found out that he's been driven out of the temple. And the Pharisees are overhearing and the disciples are, are overhearing. The blind man, as, as you remember, was healed and then he's questioned by the, the Pharisees and the religious authorities. And they keep asking him about Jesus. And he says, yeah, I, you know, all I know is that I was blind and now I see. And they're asking him, you know, how did he, and, and they finally, because he is, uh, he, and he doesn't confess faith in Jesus Christ, just believes that he's a prophet. 
but the religious authorities want to hear nothing of it and they drive him out of the temple. What is painful for this man is that in his entire life, being born blind, he was never permitted in the temple. Second Samuel 5, verse 8, you know, if, if you are born blind or lame, you don't make it past the bouncer. If you want to be further horrified, read Leviticus 21, verses 16 to 24, where they talk about what disqualifies men from being priests, and we're talking just men. It says, if you have any kind of blemish, lame, blind, a mutilated face or a limb too long, broken foot or broken hand, a hunchback or a dwarf, we probably say little person today, or a man with a blemish in his eyes, or an itching disease or scabs or crushed testicles, these may not approach the altar. This is when, when you read passages like this, I, th I think of when we hand folks a Bible and say, here, fall in love with God, and we forget about these horrifying passages. Like, what happened to Genesis 1 when, and when God finished created, creating and everything and everyone was called good? Jesus is talking to someone who has never been allowed in worship. For the first time, he knew, for a breath, he knew the possibility of communion. And it was taken away from him, almost immediately because of his testimony of being healed by Jesus. He's driven out. Again, in John 10, he's still talk, Jesus is talking with, with him and the Pharisees over here. The Pharisees, again, are the uber-religious folks. They know, the, no, they know their Bible. They know the law. And the disciples, of course, are listening. And Jesus says, I am the gate. To get into the temple in Jerusalem, you had to enter by a gate. There were many different gates around the temple, but you would have to have entered in through a gate to get there. And Jesus says, I am the gate. You enter into the fold through me. And I am the good shepherd. My flock know my voice. And we see this man through these two chapters in Scripture move from uh, believing that, you know, being ignorant, to then believing that Jesus is a prophet, to then understanding that he is the Son of God, to worshiping him. And some scholars believe that this man represents the, the Johannine community who came to believe in Jesus, who, who knew that something was up with him, who believed he was a prophet, and then came to understand that he was the son of God and came to worship him, and they were driven out of the temple. But now they understand themselves as part of the fold. Now, the fact that Jesus refer, refers to thieves and bandits and those who know his voice and those who don't, will forever animate the fearful who in their anxiety spend way too much trying to figure out who's in and who's out. And this passage has been used in anti-Semitic ways, believing that Jesus is talking about the Jewish leaders and as thieves and bandits. But Christians, we can be infinitely creative in our hubris believing that we are hearing that we are hearing Jesus's voice correctly and those other people aren't. And the church has acted as gatekeepers when it's not our job. We are the sheep and we follow Jesus. But folks are folks. And we hear, you know, and you know, what could we argue about? Oh, anything, everything. Shall we talk about baptism? We believe in our faith tradition that, that we should uh, baptize as infants. And there are people who have died because we fought about it in our church history, believing, no, 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 it's adults, and the emphasis should be on repentance. And we have, our forebears have killed each other over stuff like this. No, we hear Jesus' voice correctly, you don't. Shall we talk about the Lord's Supper? 
How is Jesus present in the meal? Schisms and denominations galore. And this isn't, you know, and I hate to say this isn't all just ancient history. The United, the United Methodist Church is splitting. It's still going on, our schisms and our fractures, because I, you know, I, we believe that, you know, some people believe the Holy Spirit is saying this, and other people are saying, no, 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 no. Psh. <laughs> but we all hear Jesus' voice, right? He is our good shepherd, and we try to follow him. So what does this, to this man that has been shunned, what does Jesus say to him? He is his entire life not allowed to participate. Jesus says to him, I have come so that you might know life and know it abundantly. Imagine it's you. Because we all, on some level, have known what it's, been, what it's like to have been rejected or be left out or wonder whether you're worthy. I have come so that you might know life and know it abundantly. What does abundant life look like? There is no one definition. But let me tell you how the, the last... Three weeks have in in our lectionary passages, which I've been preaching on. Have the last three weeks have been Jesus appearing after, you know, post Easter, first to Mary, then to Thomas and the disciples in the upper room, and last week the road to Emmaus. These ne- today and these next three weeks illustrate how knowing Christ is about living in intimacy with God. Abundant life is living in love and intimacy with God. Knowing that you are loved and that you can have a relationship with God, whether they let you in the temple or not. If we are not living and acting motivated by love, we're missing out on the abundant life that God is offering us. If we're not listening for God's voice to guide us, to to sustain us and protect us, we are missing out on the abundant life Jesus is offering us. And one way that we can live out love and intimacy with God is to accept the fact that we are sheep and we are not gatekeepers. Again, we have all been at different times in our lives. We know the feeling of being rejected, being on the outside, longing to be let in. Tuesday night, I attended my town council meeting up in Sparta, and I was was invited as part of Sparta Pride, uh, which is LGBTQIA folks and allies. And the Sparta Pride had asked the town during the month of June, which is Pride Month, whether they would be willing to raise the, the, um, the pride flag. This. And there was much debate. It had been six months of, uh, six months of crafting this, and we were given notice that, as people organize online, that p- folks who did not want to see the flag raised were organizing and were going to be there, so please, folks who are, who are pro, please show up. So I put my collar on, and I showed up, and, and just so you know, in Sparta, in New Jersey, in the last year, the Methodist church in town has a, has a pride flag outside on their property. And, and just so you know, for if a church does not have kind of, some kind of symbol outside of the building that says that LGBTQIA plus folks are welcoming, people will assume that they're not. 
but the Methodist church in town has had a pride flag out for years, and just this past year it has burned, been burned twice. So Sparta Pride asked for the town to raise a flag, and there was much debate, you know, can't be on the same flagpole as the American flag. And there's only three flags allowed on that, the, the American flag, the New Jersey flag, and the POW MIA flag. So there will be a separate flagpole and, you know, and, and, and all of this stuff. But the most distressing moment was when somebody said, you know, it would help us feel welcome in the community. And this older gentleman says aloud so that I can hear him across the room, but you're not. And the most compelling speech of the night was this young woman who, I, she's either in high school or, uh, or recently graduated, who stood up and, and you, could, you, know, you could tell, it, you know, it took all of her courage to muster to speak. And she said, you know, it's, we are marginalized. It's not like we don't feel it. It passed, by the way, three to two. We were there till 11:15. Uh, <laughs> God bless us, everyone. But we showed our colors as a town, and the divisions, and the work that needs to be done. The church, for too long, has called unclean what God has called clean. That's part of our past from which we, for, for which we need to repent and remind ourselves that Jesus is the gate and the shepherd and we are the sheep. And truth be told, as sheep, you know, left to our own devices, we'll all run off at some point. But there's another lovely parable in scripture where it says God will, Jesus will come looking for us and carry us, and carry us home. And, you know, you can imagine you know, hearing Jesus' voice, you know, when you, when you feel lost. And there will be moments where you're just like, oh, thank God. And other moments where you'll just run even farther until you're at that point where you're just like, oh, Lord, help. And there Jesus comes, still pursuing There are moments where we welcome the crook of that staff that pulls us up from danger and puts us back on our feet. And we swear we'll never stray again until we do. We are the blind man, but we are also the judgy Pharisees. And Jesus stands in the midst of us saying, follow me. I have come so that you may know life and know it abundantly. May you know God's love and may you live each and every moment of your life in conversation with God. For Jesus is the Good Shepherd and it is Good Shepherd Sunday and our affirmation for faith, of faith this morning will be the 23rd Psalm. Yea, though we walk through the valley of death, we will fear no evil, for Jesus is with us. We don't get it all right. We never will. But thank God our job is simply to point to the Good Shepherd and not ourselves. We are sheep, and that is as it should be. In Jesus' name, amen.